Hi, um, I'm Mark Dunn, the editor of Portfolio Institutional, and welcome to another interview in our portfolio briefing series, which looks at how the COVID pandemic is impacting investors. Now, in previous videos, we've spoken to trustees of defined benefit pension schemes, defined contribution pension schemes, we've spoken to asset managers, we've spoken to consultants, uh, just to get their views on various topics, uh, including things like um, heightened cyber risk uh, during the lockdowns. Uh, but this video is going to be a little different because uh, we're joined by a social enterprise. Yes, a big issue invests, uh, which she itself as a, a social merchant bank, uh, which finances uh, sustainable social enterprises. And i um, very pleased to say with me is Chief Executive Officer, Daniel Sitar. Daniel, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mark. Very good to see you this morning. Very good. And how's the lockdown been for you? As, uh, as everyone, I think we've been getting to grips with what this new normal looks like. Uh, mm -hmm. We are a, uh, a not-for-profit, a social enterprise, part of the Big Issue group. So there are about 20 staff in Big Issue Invest, uh, and we sit as part of the overall Big Issue group, where there are about 120 of us. So from we'd actually changed our working practices before the lockdown um, already in response to the, uh, to the virus. So we're all struggling to serve our clients across the country from home, just like, just like everyone else. We have about 200 organizations that we invest in at Big Issue Invest about 170 on our lending side and about 30 in our fund management portfolios. And like any other business in the UK, um, they have had to adapt. Uh, we have some extraordinary organizations. Um, Connection Crew are one really good example. Uh, they basically fit out everything from setting up tables and chairs in an event to building entire sound stages uh, for, uh, for music gigs. And the reason why they're a social enterprise is they initially started out employing people who were, who were homeless. Um, still to this day, about a fifth of their workforce at any one time um, would be homeless. But you can imagine what it's like when you're basically reliant on the events business and the pandemic happens. They went from a very healthy order book uh, in, uh, in looking at March and April to just literally zero, literally zero income. Um, so, uh, you know, how we support organizations like that through this, I mean, it's very simple. Um, we have had to do things that every financial institution would do, which is freeze loans, um, freeze capital payments. In fact, we've, um, we've frozen investment payments probably for more than half of our portfolio. Uh, Connection Crew is one of those. And actually we, 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 we made them a loan uh, to basically help them hibernate um, through this time because they know as soon as this comes to an end, whenever that end happens, there are going to be organizations with a backlog of events they want to come out and, and produce and Connection Crew need to be right back um, there again. Uh, they did have one final bit of business before they uh, uh, hibernated, uh, which was helping out um, some of the fit out of the Nightingale Hospital uh, at the Excel Centre uh, in London. So uh, that, was a, that was a little bit of good news um, uh, for them in this stage. Okay. Um, now in your career, have you ever experienced such economic disruption before? I haven't experienced anything quite like this. I have um, had, uh, as, a, as a child, um, had to flee um, as a refugee. Um, I've lived through, as a young person, uh, civil war, uh, military coups, um, floods, famines, um, lived in countries where infectious diseases are, are rife, uh, but nothing on this scale. This is off the scale of anything that we've, um, that we've experienced before. I, I think it is, though, useful to think about um, the number of recessions that we've been through in our working lives. And I think that's something that people have not got so used to. I mean, if you think about the mass unemployment of the recession of the, in the 1980s, um, that scale of economic disruption, uh, recession in the 90s, recession around 2000, um, the global financial crisis. I mean, that seems recent to some of us, but there are, there's an entire working generation of people who haven't been through that experience um, of, of recession and fundamental economic disruption. So I think there is something where um, those people who have been through some economic downturn before 
uh, can recognize some familiar patterns. But I, I, I sit with, um, you know, older and wiser investors on my investment committee mm -hmm. who will say, you know, in, in 40 years of investing experience, I have never seen anything like this. This is, this is off the scale. So did Big Issue Invest have some kind of plan in place if there was a sort of a sharp downturn? Yeah. So I looked at my risk register and, uh, and I have to hold up my hand and say I did not have a global pandemic on my risk register. Now, I know that there are organizations that did. Yeah, Wimbledon uh, had insurance for a global pandemic. And there are right. charities and social enterprises that we have backed who did have um, pandemic insurance. So there are people who thought seriously about a known global risk because this is a known global risk and put it into their plans. It wasn't in my risk register, but I'm really pleased to say that a whole bunch of things that were in our risk register then started ticking up uh, and it worked. It actually, it, it worked well in some ways. Um, and without taking a, uh, a political stance on Brexit, uh, all of the planning we had to do for Brexit actually really helped us. Uh, because we were thinking about things like mass civil disobedience uh, and the inability to access premises for, for a number of days. Uh, mm -hmm. So we were, we were fairly recently well prepared, um, having reviewed all our, um, uh, all our disaster um, programs uh, as a result of Brexit. So actually, all that uh, planning and thinking did, um, did help us. So that, that was... Um, that, so no, we haven't thought about this uh, as such fascinating thing though for us is that we've been able to sustain ourselves uh, in a way that I think has been really extraordinary um, as a, and there are two sides to us and we, we are an independent organization um, as a social enterprise ourselves we have around uh, 23 million in our loan fund side and about 43 million um, funds under management in our in our three limited partnership funds so we are a micro organization in the scale of the financial services industry. But what we've been able to do is that just as we have gone to our, um, the people we invest in and said, you know what, um, your, your request, very sensible, just let's stop taking money out of the sector. That's the best thing we can do. We've been able to go to our investors in turn and say to them, you know what, in order to pass on that deal, you need to do the same thing for us. Let's all pause. And as an ecosystem, if we move together and do that kind of pause, then it works well for, uh, for all of us. Our sister organization, um, or, or I should really say our parent organization, The Big Issue magazine, um, also went through a really profound transformation. Because you can imagine, um, this is actually, this, this just arrived through my, through my door today. Um, this is a copy of the, uh, the Big Issue magazine. So normally this is sold by um, around 2,000 vendors. Um, up and down the country uh, every day, and they uh, it's a trading option for them. So they're self-employed, they buy the magazine from us for £1.50, and they sell it to the general public uh, for £3, and the £1.50 in there is their margin. So you can imagine when homeless people were taken off the street at the start of this pandemic, uh, you have uh, your, your, your vendor base disappears. Uh, the people who buy the magazine, clearly not on the streets. So there was an incredible pivot in the magazine. Uh, in 10 days, they got an app version out on the um, Apple store. And this, um, this came through my door because I took, out, I took out a subscription to the magazine. So we always had a small scale subscription operation in the magazine side, um, and that has been pushed out and promoted. We've had, the magazines had tremendous support. Um, the Times uh, ran an appeal uh, for the big issue alongside Family Action, which has been absolutely incredible. And that, that kind of donation money has supported our vendors, and it's also let the organization pivot its, its business model. So that by the time the vendors come back on the streets, uh, we'll, we'll still have a product for them to sell. And we will have done many, many things in that magazine business that always had to be done in terms of a transition to a cashless um, society, that, 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 that journey we've gone on, to be able to make sure that every vendor who gets out on the street uh, can be able to take cashless transactions in a way that they couldn't before. So both on our Big Issue Invest side, which I lead, and on the magazine side, I think just demonstrates what charities and social enterprises are having to do all up and down the country 
in order to carry on serving people at this time when they need it the most. It's an interesting point. I mean, on the big issue and best side of things, uh, are people still coming to you asking you for, to fund their businesses, to fund their projects? Or is it, as we talked about there in the openings, people coming to you and say, we need a bit more help here for, for existing projects or you've, you've financed? It's, it's, a, it's a mix. And I tend to think that everything I believe to be true two weeks ago is now not the case. And that's, that's probably been the pattern of this pandemic. That uh, right back at the, before any of this, uh, of the lockdown was happening, we were already looking at our portfolio and trying to figure out who was going to be impacted. And I thought the care businesses in our portfolio, like um, Cornerstone up in Scotland or Be Caring, which is an employee-owned care business, I thought that's where we would see some of the biggest um, financial impacts because we were anticipating they would have a higher cost base, people would be sick, they'd be bringing in agency staff, their costs would go up, their income would be the same, they'd be under financial pressure. In fact, that's not been the case. Uh, the government's interventions to support the care sector have been reflected in what we see in our portfolio. Um, local authorities have been able to pay people uh, on different terms than normally. They're paying more in advance rather than in, in arrears. So all kinds of things have washed through that bit of the sector in a way that, um, that I, I certainly hadn't anticipated and has been really, really positive. Um, the bits, obviously, of the portfolio, any charity or social enterprise that has any kind of public-facing service has been really hammered. Uh, obviously, charity shops, uh, people offering um, uh, learning or training or educational services, um, anybody out there interacting with other people has had their business model really hammered. So we have, um, in terms of the, the financial support that uh, that we that we've had, we have had people approaching us around this, in a small way at this stage around uh, transforming their operations to uh, to the new normal. So just what I described with the with the big issue, um, it's investing to transform for for a new uh, a new situation. I don't think we've really seen the the start of this. Um, which uh, which may be a bit of a depressing thought, but uh, there are reasons why you say, do you have three months reserves? Yes, no. If you have three months reserves, probably a good thing. So, you know, the months have been ticking by. So we are just beginning to see the financial impact on um, charities and social enterprises as with other businesses. So reserves will be um, exhausted. And I expect we will see what we see typically um, in recession time. That's just when things start to look brighter, people start going bust because they will have exhausted their um, resources just to stay alive. And at the need when they need cash and liquidity to get back trading again and to invest in restarting the operation, um, they will have least financial resources available to them. In our sector, I would say the furlough scheme has been it's been widely used. It's been fantastic uh, for charities and social enterprises, just like the commercial sector, with the one caveat that uh, the very time when your services are needed, uh, our charities provide mental health support to people. Uh, that is needed more than ever. And if you have to furlough your staff because your donations have, um, have fallen, your trading income has fallen, you're less able to provide the very support that you need and the nature of that scheme is fairly obviously that if you're furloughed, you are not allowed to work. So for a charity or social enterprise delivering a social goods service, that is a real, uh, you know, a, a real issue. It has let people survive. It has let people stay in, in employment. And those are very good things. We've also seen um, strong take up of the bounce back business loans um, scheme by charities and social enterprises. Um, the speed of that and the simplicity of that uh, of that government-backed scheme delivered by the mainstream banks uh, has been really, uh, really helpful from, from what we can see at this, this early stage. And we ourselves participate in the, um, the C-bills, the, uh, the Coronavirus Business Interruption Loan Scheme. Um, we do that through a consortium, through an organization called the Social Investment Business and uh, Big Society Capital, Social and Sustainable Capital, and Charity Bank. And uh, this grouping is providing um, corona business fire, um, business interruption loans uh, to um, charities and social enterprises right now uh, so that's been that's been 
a really good thing that we've been that we've been able to do um, with the support of our of our investors. Okay. Can you tell me a bit more about this partnership you've struck up with social investment business um, since the yeah. outbreak? Yeah, yeah. So um, there is a um, there's an array of organisations that do social investment um, across the uh, across the UK and in fact in fact internationally and we are we are one of those and this is this is not a new phenomenon um, in 1542 uh, a gentleman called Sir Thomas White set up the Sir Thomas White loan charity and it operates in Leicester and its purpose was to provide loans for apprentices who are too poor to buy their own tools to become okay. class. So it's the definition still to this day. It's like if you're self-employed and the tax man looks at you and says, really, are you self-employed? And you say, yeah, look, here's my own PC. I bring my own computer to work. It's like still to this day, there's something about if you bring your own tools to work, you're self-employed. So back in those days, if you couldn't afford to buy your own tools, you couldn't become a craftsman. And I'm sorry to use a gendered um, term on it. Um, they history recalls them as craftsmen, and I'm sure there were craftswomen in there. So, um, so he made uh, very low cost loans to apprentices to buy their own tools, uh, letting them get into employment and letting their income grow. Otherwise, they would be stuck in poverty. So, 1542, he was doing it. And if you search him up to this day, this is Thomas White. Uh, loan organization is operating in Leicester and um, still making loans to self-employed people uh, to this very day um, and they were actually supported by one of the, um, the city guilds in that uh, in that startup uh, so this has been going for a long time 1775 um, a group of canal diggers in Birmingham got together and formed the world's first building society uh, they saved money in a pint pot uh, mug uh, at Richard Ketley's um, pub uh, in uh, in Birmingham. In fact, there's a plaque to this day on the and it's hang, it hangs up on the edge of the inner city ring road in Birmingham. Uh, I tried to take some colleagues there to, to look at it, and what I hadn't realised is they'd reprofiled the ring road, and I was saying no, 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 it, there's pedestrian access, and I hadn't realised they're taking away all the pedestrian access to this roundabout. So we were running across rush hour, uh, multi-lane ring road traffic, um, oh, okay, trying yeah. to see a plaque which had actually been relocated to a much safer place. So uh, that would have taken out some of our brightest and best, but fortunately we survived. So 15, yeah, 1775, so a year before Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations, a year before US independence, um, people came together to solve a problem, which was how to get affordable housing. And yeah. that came to an extraordinary movement. So every hundred years or so, another wave of social investment organizations comes through. So all we're really doing today is reinventing uh, some of those social movements of the past with, with the likes of yeah. ourselves at Big Issue Invest. Um, Charity Bank, um, it was actually, I, I, I worked there briefly around the time when it, um, for four years, two years before it became a bank and two years afterwards, it was a loan fund set up by Charities Aid Foundation to lend to charities that couldn't get access to mainstream bank finance. And it was converted to a bank in 2002. A fantastic portfolio. Mm -hmm of bank-like lending uh, and deposits from people who, who want to put their money um, behind causes like that. So what we've done with this, with this scheme is we've partnered up uh, because we do, um, you know, I don't know if we quite compete with each other. Um, frenemies, what are we, friendly enemies. Um, we, we do, um, we work alongside each other often. Sometimes we're in syndicated loans. So it made a great deal of sense for us to group up. We're very fortunate that we're supported by an organization called Big Society Capital. They're a wholesaler for this sector, um, set up with money from unclaimed assets uh, that was uh, that, that up to that point were, was sitting in mainstream banks unclaimed. It would be your great aunt's deposit account that you missed when you were going through the will uh, and you, you missed that five grand. So prior to the establishment of the Reclaim Fund and Big Society Capital, that just went onto banks' balance sheets as their money after 15 years or so. So nowadays it goes through the reclaim fund and out to big society capital and then out to organizations such as ours doing this kind of social investing. So it made a lot of sense for us to partner up. Big society capital has put in money, it's attracting other money alongside it. And the British Business Bank's extended its guarantee scheme uh, to that facility operated by the social investment business. And we in Charity Bank and Social and Sustainable Capital and in the future some others will be using that common pool. So it's a, it, I think it's a, 
it's it, essentially what we're doing is we're using mainstream tools to achieve good social outcomes. So we are a lender, we are an investor, um, we make loans, we have limited partnership um, funds, just like many investors would have, a bit at a much smaller scale than many in the, in the conventional yeah. world. But we use these conventional um, tools for unconventional purposes, supporting charities and social enterprises, which like any other um, small to medium sized um, enterprise need finance. They have the same financing needs. They need cash flow support. They need bridging finance. They need invoice mm -hmm. discounting. They need to invest in capital projects. They need mm -hmm. to invest in growth. So all the things that people need finance for um, in, in the general um, economy, um, so do charities and social enterprises. And that's, that's what we do. It sounds like with uh, rising unemployment at the moment and businesses closing that um, even in a post-COVID world, we're expecting that uh, charities like yourself are going to be in much demand. Well, there is some, I mean, there's good news and bad news. I, I, think, um, I think the bad news that we are all um, anticipating is the economy um, is, uh, is going to be in a difficult state. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I don't envy the, the decisions that, uh, that governments, uh, both in the civil service and at a political level, are, are, are making. Um, this is, um, you know, this is an extraordinary time. We all thought the global financial crisis was an extraordinary, uh, extraordinary thing, and this is, um, you know, this is this is another step um, further out. Um, and I think, in some ways, we are very lucky that it is the nature of the virus that it is. It isn't the SARS or a MERS level of fatality. It's still um, a great, um, a great tragedy for everyone who's been who's been affected um, yeah. by it. Yeah. Uh, but we are expecting and um, anticipating uh, some deep slowdown recession um, after this. But the, the thing that, that tends to happen um, in these times is that there then tends to be a real interest in putting money to social purpose use. Okay. So back in the 1990s, there was a banking crisis in Scandinavia. And it led to an upsurge of interest in organizations in Scandinavia called the JAKs. Uh, JAK stands for Jord Arbeit and Capital, so land, labor, and capital. You can see what route they came from as organizations. They're essentially raising money at zero interest and lending it at zero interest and, uh, and using that to make very affordable mortgages uh, to people. And the interest in those schemes, um, which are small scale, but the interest in them really grew because people could clearly see what their money was doing. Now that's at one extreme end, but recession after recession, there has always been an upsurge in interest in social investment, be it interest in ecology building society or Triodos Bank, or the more, uh, the more risk-based lenders such as ourselves, a big issue invest. Because people, two things happen. I think one, people want to put something back and they want to do something. And being able to do something positive with your money is a really good yeah. thing that people can do. And the second thing is that they, they want to see where their money's going. Um, our financial services industry that we operate in can be disintermediated and opaque uh, to where the investor's money um, is, is going. And there's a real simplicity in what we do. We publish the list of people that we invest in. You can clearly see what we do, how we do it. And it's, it's pretty simple stuff. We raise money and we lend it, or we invest it. Uh, very straightforward. And people like that transparency and connection to their money that they get with social investment. So post-recession, there tends to be a real interest in this. And there is a need. You know, we are going to have to be doing things that, is, uh, that we probably haven't done at scale before around um, training people back into um, employment. Um, in the last um, 10 or 15 years, um, you know, after the global financial crisis, we avoided the worst of recession through the gig economy and not having an increase in real, uh, in real wages. And that meant we had a lot of focus on people not in education, employment and training. But I think we are going to have a whole wave of reskilling um, work to do um, around employment um, in a way that, that probably hasn't happened in 15 or 20 years. So it will be, it will be different uh, than, uh, than what we have done um, in the past. But the demand will be there for our services. I mean, it'd be great if it wasn't. Um, we go pack up, um, put our feet up and uh, go off to some desert island and, uh, and, and picnic away the rest of our careers. But 
charities and social enterprises are needed now more than they ever have been. Thank you. Daniel, it's been great speaking to you. Thank you very much for your time and sharing your thoughts with us. And I'm, I'm sure the social aspect of ESG um, will continue to be a theme playing out through both during and post this, this crisis. So thank you very much for your time and I hope that you stay safe. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Goodbye.